All right, well, we're ready to get started tonight, uh, going through our study of Revelation, and tonight we're going to be in Revelation chapter 5, and uh, this is, if you've not read this chapter, this chapter of Revelation is probably one of the more uh, awe-inspiring and glorious pictures in, in, in the first part of Revelation. It's Last week, we were in chapter 4, which we see the throne in heaven, and that in itself is um, an amazing picture. But this week, when we're in chapter 5, man, it is just, when, when you start to try to picture with your mind what you're reading with your, with your brain, and, and you, you, know, you, you read the words and you see the descriptions and you try to get a picture of it in your head, uh, it's hard to do, you know, because we don't have a reference point. This is maybe one of the more difficult things about Revelation. Many of the things we'll read, we don't have a good reference point to compare and, and visualize what's being described. John saw a vision of heaven that no one still living has seen, and so it's really difficult. We... We try to visualize best we can based on what we know from earth. But every understand this, every single comparison we will make to the heavenly descriptions is going to fall short because we, just, we don't have the right reference point to really take in the majesty and the glory of what John was seeing. So just kind of uh, understand that going in, that uh, whatever, however amazing we think it is, it's way more than that. That's a good way to think of it, okay, when we talk about heaven. So Revelation 5, so hopefully you found your place there. I just want to introduce the text and, and kind of give you a little, um, maybe a, uh, not an earthly comparison really, but more of a, uh, a description, maybe a comparison that will help us, uh, in some way, help us understand. All right, so in 1989, I don't know if anybody watches action-adventure-type movies. Those are my favorite. That's my favorite category. Uh, if it's, if it's uh, drama or touchy-feely or and all that, I just don't care anything about that at all. I want to see somebody fighting somebody or a good guy against a bad guy or, you know, that type of stuff. I want to see action-adventure. So in 1989, there was a film released... Uh, in the series of, if you remember, the old Harrison Ford films, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones, that whole um, category of films. It was called Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Now this particular uh, movie, the plot, was about, it was a story of a professor, Indiana Jones, and his father, who was played by Sean Connery, went on this archaeological search for the Holy Grail. It was uh, supposed to be, uh, rumored to be, the actual cup that Jesus had used at the Last Supper. Okay, and so that, that's what they were you know, hunting for. And so they went on this massive trip all over the world to search. So when they eventually located the ruins where the grail was thought to, to, to be, they had to make it through. When they, I mean, it's like you, you follow this map and you encounter all kind of things along the way. You finally get to... The, the, the area where you think it is in this, um, this, not this building, it's kind of like a, a pyramid ruin anyway, it's in there somewhere, but you're here, okay? You finally get there. And then, as if all that wasn't enough, now you have to go through a series of tests and uh, think about, you know, it's like uh, there's, there's uh, what you call, um, like booby traps, you know, there's stuff everywhere, and if you make the wrong step, it could result in bad things, right? So uh, they're going through these catacombs and all these different, there's spider webs everywhere, and they're trying to figure out the little puzzles and things they have to get to the, to the final step. Well, they finally get to the inner chamber where this thing's supposed to be, and it's a room filled with cups. Every manner of cup you can imagine. So it's not just like they like a treasure map they oh they found it let's go it, you know they finally got there and it was it wasn't one cup it was hundreds of cups and there was this elderly guard 
in there. He'd been in there for who knows how long. He's standing there. With a, he can't even lift his sword anymore. He's so, so decrepit. But he's, his mission is to guard the Holy Grail. And so they get there and they ask a question. He says, well, how am I supposed to know which one? And the guard just simply says, here's his advice. Choose wisely. Well, okay. Well, one of the bad guys shows up. And he wants to just, you know, take charge and get in front. So he makes his choice right quick. Well, you're supposed to take, take your cup, the one you choose, dip it in the water. And if that's the right one, then everything's good. Well, it was wrong, and it resulted, I won't go into the details, let's just say it was a gruesome death for this poor man. He cho- and, and here's what the guard said. This is all he said. He chose poorly, you know, as he's laying there dead. So now it comes time for Indiana Jones to choose, and the guy just says, choose wisely. So he picks up the cup, and he says, actually says these words in the movie, uh, this looks like the cup of a carpenter, talking about Jesus. And it's very unassuming, it's not decorated, it's just plain, and he picks it up, and it ends up being the right one. So, uh, happy ending, everything's great. So, in the end, all that two-hour movie, Only one person was found to be worthy to pick up the right cup and to say his father was injured, it saved him, and, you know, everybody lived happily ever after. So the reason why he was deemed worthy to pick up this cup in this movie was because he had successfully passed all the tests along the way. So that's a very um, human man-centered type of example but on a similar note tonight this 14 verse little chapter is going to show us why only one person is worthy to take this scroll and to open it up and to look inside it and to execute the will of God that's found that we see here in Revelation 5 so we're going to read these 14 verses and then hopefully see this beautiful picture that the Lord painted for us by revealing this to John. So let's look at Revelation 5, starting verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to even look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth 
and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that this word, this picture, this vision of heaven and of the Lamb of God, I pray that it would be so clear to us tonight that we would hopefully see you more clearly and that having done that, we would worship you and praise you more fully. Speak to us tonight, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One commentator looking at this chapter says that the center of gravity of chapter 5 lies in the three hymns of praise, verse 9, verse 12, and verse 13. They're addressed to the Lamb, and they beautifully combine the worship of the Lamb in in hymns 1 and 2 with the worship of the one who sits on the throne in hymn 3, which is addressed to the, the one who sits on the throne and the Lamb. And the movement of the whole scene focuses on the slain Lamb as he takes the scroll from the hand of the one on the throne. And the actions of all the other participants are described in terms of worship directed to the Lamb and the one on the throne. The culminating emphasis is on the worthiness of the Lamb to receive worship because of his death. This is an amazing picture that John sees. It's really one paragraph. It's not really split up, but there are two kind of uh, two divisions in this scene that we see. And the first one is this: things are not always as they seem. Things are not always as they seem. Sometimes weakness uh, is really strength. Sometimes uh, humility is really power and and sometimes we see something and we perceive it a particular way but then when we learn more and we get closer to the situation maybe we get more information then we see oh that's not exactly what I expected and that's what we're going to see here as this chapter unfolds John sees a scroll first thing he sees a scroll it's in the right hand of the one who is seated on the throne in heaven now, you remember last week, chapter 4, we, we saw more clearly the throne in heaven and, and the songs that were being sung as uh, the four living creatures were saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And even the way the chapter ended last week, as the elders were casting their crowns before the throne and saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created and so last week we introduced that idea of God being worthy but it was in a creation perspective it was you're worthy because you created all these things well this week we see the lamb and we see the one on the throne and we see that now the the worthiness of the savior is is seen not so much out of creation but in redemption In his death and sacrifice. So John sees this scroll. It's in the right hand of the one seated on the throne. The scroll had writing all over it inside and out. But it was sealed with seven seals. So the scroll, the the nature of the document itself that John sees. Because it was typically just written on one side. But this is written all over the place. And in, in that culture... That would have been understood as a more of a private, uh, secure type of communication. It could only be opened by a certain person that had the authority to do so. And that's going to come into play here, and that's part of the description of the scroll. Because here's what we find out about what's in the scroll. It's not only about judgment or about the inheritance of the kingdom, but it contains the announcement of the consummation of history how things are going to ultimately end up for all people. Judgment for the world, the final reward for the saints, and Christ alone as the Messiah is the executor, just like you would have a last will and testament. Christ is the executor 
of the purposes of God and the heir of the inheritance of the world. So he obtains this position because of his substitutionary, sacrificial death on the cross. That gains his position of authority. So there's not another uh, being in existence that has died for the sin of the world. Only Jesus. So he is unique uh, and distinct in his authority and his position. So John sees this scroll. Then he sees a strong angel. So he's trying to take all this in. and, And if you try to just develop a mental picture of what he must be seeing he sees the throne he sees the one seated on the throne he's got a scroll in his hand and he sees this angel and the angel is proclaiming with a loud voice he's asking a question who's worthy who's worthy here's the scroll who is capable who has the standing or the authority to to open that scroll or to look into it and look at, the, look at the, um, the, the state of affairs here, if you will, in, in heaven. As soon as the question is asked, the answer is given. No one. No one. And look where, he, look where he says. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth. There, there's nobody. Nobody is able to open the scroll or to look into it. So what does John do in response? starts to cry because here's here's the final will and purposes of god almighty right there in this scroll and and nobody can access it because nobody's worthy to open that thing not in heaven not on earth not under the earth nowhere So as John begins to weep loudly because of the disposition of the scroll, it's no one's worthy to open it. One of the elders, you know, there's 24 elders around the throne. Well, one of the elders spoke up and responded to John, and he said, Stop your crying. Stop your crying. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Can you you picture, anybody ever um, read the Chronicles of Narnia? C.S. Lewis. You know the main character of the, the, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe? It's, it's a lion. Li- the lion's the king. He's all-powerful. And there's one line in that, in that book that's um, very profound. And, and someone who, who's awaiting the, the arrival of the, the king, the lion, and he's starting to get a little worried because, you know, it's a lion. And he says, is he safe? He said, no, but he's good. That's our, our, our king. He, he, he's dangerous because he's so powerful, but he's good to those who love him. And so the elder tells John, stop crying. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. The word there, is, uh, it's a picture of um, triumph or overcoming conquering, win, uh, winning a victory is the, is the picture of that word that's used there. He is able to open the scroll and open its seven seals. You know, when John was about to turn and see the lion of the tribe of Judah, what do you suppose he expected to see? What, do you think he had any preconceived idea maybe? When this elder says to him, weep no longer, the lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered. What do you expect to see? I would expect to see something just uh, amazing, huge, strong, powerful, victorious, mighty. A lion, you know, I mean, just everything you can picture. King of the jungle, right? That's what you expect to see. John's not going to see that. Because the difference between verse 5 and verse 6 is a a picture of a lion and then the appearance of a lamb. It reminds me of 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 9 and 10. This is the, the application for us, how things are not always as they seem. Sometimes when you expect to see what you think is going to be strong, or maybe in the world's eyes who's strong, what you see is what you might think is weak in the world's eyes. You know, in in 2 Corinthians 12, 
Paul is pleading with the Lord to remove this thorn in the flesh that he has. He's pleading three times, he says. Please take it away. And you you know what God tells him? Verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you. I'm I'm not going to take that away from you, but I'm going to give you the grace you need to withstand it. Because it has a purpose. And then he says, in verse 10, Paul says, Therefore, I will rejoice in my weaknesses, in in my shortcomings. And the the way he closes verse 10, he says, When I'm weak, then I'm strong. See, his weakness is, is what amplifies the power of God in his life. We don't understand how powerful God can be until we get to our wit's end and we don't have any more strength left. And we know if anybody's going to help me, it's got to be God because I can't do it anymore. And then God's strength is revealed. It's like we can, as long as we think we can do it on our own, God can't show off. Does that make sense? He's got every bit of it. Yeah. And he's worthy because of the strength he demonstrated at the cross. So the transition from verse 5 to verse 6, hearing that the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, and then turning in verse 6, and here's what John sees. A lamb, the Greek word there is the word for a, a young sheep. Literally, it's what he sees. Between the throne, the four living creatures, and among the elders, he sees a lamb standing, and it looks as though it had been slain. Now, that that word there is very interesting. Because if you know anything about slaughtering a a sheep or a lamb, you know what they do? They, they, They cut his throat. And that's what the word means. The word that's used there for slain, that's what, that's what John writes down for us. It looked as though it had been slain. A young sheep. Now, does that, does that inspire a picture of strength and power? A little young sheep that's been slaughtered? No. Things are not always as they seem. That's the, the second point of this beautiful message here from chapter 5 is... There is none like the Lamb of God. He's not your typical Lamb. This Lamb was standing between the throne and the four living creatures among the elders, looking as if it had been slain. It had seven horns, and it had seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And uh, much of the scholarship surrounding this is, is um, thinking that this is a symbolic reference to the divine Holy Spirit that's sent forth by Christ into the world, the seven spirits of God. So what is the first thing that the Lamb does when He comes on the scene? He goes and takes that scroll. Now, I, want you to, I need you to, to try to get in your mind how profound a moment that is. Because what is said in verse 3 and verse 4, No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was found uh, worthy to take the scroll or to look into it. John started crying because no one was worthy. No one was found. And then he sees a, a lamb after the elder says, The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so he can open the scroll. And then John sees a lamb. But the first thing the lamb does in verse 7, he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. A very definitive act. He doesn't just he doesn't go up to the throne and, can I please have the scroll? No, he took it. He took it as a show of strength and power and authority of his position. So he took the scroll from the right hand of the one seated on the throne. Now the one on the throne then has authorized the slain messianic king to execute him and for the redemption of the world because it's in and through the Lamb that God is at work in the history for the salvation of humanity. His, it was Jesus' victorious death on the cross that is the basis for His authority to redeem the world by taking and opening the scroll. So taking the scroll was not the act that sealed the deal. It was His death on the cross. That sealed the deal. There can't be any mistake about that. It was the fact that Jesus died on the cross 
that then put him in that position of authority that he could go and take the scroll. He was worthy in every sense of the word. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is worthy. And we're going to see that very clearly here in just a moment. So what happens? We saw John's response to the news, right? First of all, there was nobody found, and he started crying. Then the elder told him not to cry anymore because the lion of the tribe of Judah had conquered. And then he sees the lamb. The lamb then takes the scroll from the hand of the one seated on the throne. And what is the response to that? Look at verse 8. When he had taken the scroll, it's almost like that set off the worship service right there. When he took that scroll and everybody who was around the throne in heaven saw the Lamb of God holding the scroll, signifying he's worthy. So this is what they do. The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Humble submission and, and praise to the Lamb. They're each holding a harp and, the Bible says, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. You, now, you know the significance of that. They're holding golden bowls of incense, and the Bible says that is the prayers of the saints. Where are the prayers of the saints? They're being ushered in, up to the throne of God. You, you know what that means? You know what Jesus does for us? Every day, Roy, 24-7, Jesus is interceding for us. That means Jesus hears our prayers. He is our advocate before the Father. So He communicates. He's our go-between. He's the mediator. The, the, uh, Paul said to Timothy, there's one mediator between God and man. It's the man Christ Jesus. So constantly... As we pray, our prayers are ushered into God's presence. Golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So as they fall down as a show of humility and worship, doing, giving homage to the Son, they're singing a new song, verse 9. They sing a new song, and what's the first word in the song? Worthy. Worthy are you. They're singing to the Lamb. Worthy are you to take the scroll to open its seals. Why is that? For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you've made them a kingdom and priests God, and they shall reign on the earth. This right here is a picture of the worship of gathering around the throne of God. So if you ever needed any more motivation or um, reasoning for why we have mission efforts all over the world, why we, you know, we, we see the, the mandate by God to make disciples of all nations, we see Jesus say in Acts 1-8, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Right here. Right here. Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. Where? From every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. That means gathered around the throne of God, every single people group, every single language, every group of people from all over this planet are, are going to be represented around the throne of God. That's why there are missionaries. That's why our mission is so much larger than a five-mile radius around our property. It it's, starts there, and it goes out. It goes all over to the ends of the earth. I saw, a, a, in fact, I, I passed it along. I saw a, a group asking for prayer even uh, this morning. Now, let me read it to you. Let me read it to you. Prayer, praying that this week, this, this was the, the prayer from this group, praying that this week people would be raised up. Let me get the right wording here. 
Pray that God will raise up Christians who are willing to go to the ends of the earth, to the most out-of-the-way places, in order to proclaim the gospel to those who have never heard it. We talk about this all the time, about um, the importance of being multifaceted in our mission, not just local, but local and national and international. It's a, it's a question of access to the gospel, not... Uh, well, those people are more lost than these. No, that's not, that's not how it works. Everybody's, you know, everybody who's lost is equally lost. But some people have more access to the truth than others. And so God's people are called to go. We are a sent people. And this is why, right here, this is why. When we read in verse 9 that God ha- has, through Christ... Through the Lamb has ransomed people for God from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And made them a kingdom and priest to, to our God and they'll reign on the earth. Man, that's a, a beautiful picture of what worship around the throne looks like. Every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. We all need Jesus. And so Jesus accomplished that. By His blood, the Lamb of God, He accomplished that. So, first of all, the first hymn that we hear is that one. And it's the four living creatures, and it's the 24 elders. So, it's 28 people, or 28 beings, gathered around the throne, falling down before the Lamb, and singing this new song. Now, I want you to see this interesting little development here. Because as this, the vision progresses, the number of people worshiping grows. It's, it's like a chorus just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It starts out with just 28 worshipers. And then, the very next verse, 7, John says, Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels. And now he can't number them all. There are thousands of thousands, 10,000 upon 10,000. This translation says myriads of myriads. Can't number them all. Many angels. And hear what, here's what they're saying with a loud voice. Again, first word, worthy. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. So this 28-person group of worshipers has just grown to a heavenly chorus. You can't, you can't take them all in, there's so many. You can't count them all. And they're saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Honestly, is there any greater truth in our faith? Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Is is there any fact more important to us personally, on a personal level? Jesus Christ died for our sins. Is there anything more important to us than that? Were it not for that single act in history... We would be lost, hopeless, helpless, headed for hell. Every one of us. But because the Lamb of God was slain for the sins of the world. And we we can see this as a reality. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. He's receiving power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. And that last word, blessing, it could be also translated as praise. It's it's attributed to the Lamb because of the sacrifice on our behalf. He ransomed people for God by His blood. It's it's just a growing worship. It's almost as if... um, You ever ever been to a, a, a major city... And uh, somewhere, uh, a city big enough to where you might find a street performer. You ever seen that? Somewhere like, you see it in New Orleans uh, or New York City, places like that. New Orleans, especially down 
uh, in the French Quarter. There's all kind of different performers. We, we saw one, the, the Southern Baptist Convention was there years ago, and, and we, we went down to it, and uh, there's a guy standing there that was completely painted silver, you know, t- t- and, he, and he was like, he was just perfectly still. I mean, you couldn't, if you sat there and watched him, you couldn't even see him breathing. But he was a real guy just standing there covered in silver paint and looked like a statue. And that was his, that was his deal. That was his performance, I guess. But you ever notice when, whenever a street performer is, uh, is really good at whatever they're doing, you ever notice how you might start out, like if you're passing by, you might say, oh, there's like six or eight people gathered around. And, you know, and, and as people walk by, then some people walk, and then they'll stop. And they're like, I want to watch this for a little while. Then in, instead of six, eight, then it's like 20, 25. And then other people, the more people stop and watch, then the more people want to stop and watch. Because then, after the first few people gather, then what do the other people say? I wonder why everybody's gathered around there. I better stop and see what's going on, right? It's curiosity. And so, in this case, there's no curiosity. It's knowledge of what has happened. So here, you have a group of 28, and it immediately goes to innumerable thousands and thousands of angels singing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the Lamb. John then hears, as this this picture closes out, He's heard the four living creatures and the 24 elders. Then he's heard thousands and thousands and thousands of angels. And now as if that were not enough. This this last picture is amazing. Verse 13 says, I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them. That's nobody's left out. Okay, that's everybody everywhere. Heaven, earth, under the earth, in the sea, everything. And he heard every creature in heaven saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. See, now it's not just the Lamb. Now it's both of them, Father and Son. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever. So how does this worship gathering end? And by the way, you know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of the ending of Paul's uh, hymn of praise, Philippians chapter 2. You remember when Paul paints that beautiful picture about how Jesus, he was God, but he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, he humbled himself, but took the form of a bondservant, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself even to obedience uh, to the death of a cross. But you remember what happens in verse 9? Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, what's going to happen? Every knee will bow where? In heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. It's like that's a preview of what's happening right here. Paul knew it was going to happen. John is seeing it happen. Heavenly vision. Everyone in heaven, on earth, under the earth, in the sea and all that's in them. To the Lamb and to the one who sits on the throne, be blessing, honor, glory, and power forever and ever. And at the conclusion, I say (laughs) the conclusion of the vision, not the conclusion of the worship, because the worship's still going on. It doesn't stop ever. This is always happening. The four living creatures said, Amen. That's a, a verbal voice of, a, of agreement to what's happened. When you, you know what you say, when you say amen, you're, you're agreeing with what's happened or what's been said. Or that's what the, the four living creatures said, amen. And what did the elders do? They fell down and worshiped. Folks, there, there's a, a posture to worship. And when Jesus walks in the room, Nobody's going to be kind of bowed up and chest out, shoulders back, you know, thinking I'm all whatever. Nobody's going to have that posture. 
in the presence of Jesus. It's going to be humility. It's going to be worship to one who is greater. When Jesus is the focus of the worship, He's the central figure in this whole picture because He's the only one who is worthy of all these things that have been ascribed to Him through all these three different hymns, power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. And then to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb is blessing, honor, glory, and power forever and ever. There's only one worthy of that, and it's none of us. <laughs> it's only Jesus. And so that's why the one on the throne, the Father, and Jesus, the Lamb of God, that's why that they're the focus of the worship because they're the only one worthy our god father son and holy spirit he is the only one worthy of our worship anything else that tries to tempt us to draw away worship away from god or away from christ into something else that's that's an idol doesn't matter what it is there there are no um n- no one is capable no rival exists for Jesus because Jesus is the only one who died and and that's what this ultimately that's what this makes clear Jesus is the only one who died and and by his blood ransomed people for God from every tribe tongue people and nation so that's why only Jesus is worthy so let me conclude just by pointing out two uh, major contrast between this heavenly scene and the world where we live today. Two major contrasts between the heavenly scene that we've just read about and the world in which we find ourselves. First of all, we've seen that true strength is often disguised in robes of apparent weakness. We have to be careful that we don't fall for the power plays of this world which would try to overcome us and drag us into participation in this anti-God system. But instead, we as Christians, we need to overcome the world by cultivating the kind of true strength, just like Jesus demonstrated on His way to the cross, acting in love for the welfare of others, regardless of the personal cost. That's what Jesus did. So the world could certainly use more Christian with an attitude like that, especially in a, in a culture of look out for number one and nobody else, right? The second contrast we've observed is it's a little bit more subtle, but it's just as serious. This is the contrast between the praise and worship that's given to God by the creatures that are in His presence versus the praise and worship given to God by those of us who are still on the earth. True worship and praise of God is sometimes hard to find, uh, even in our modern churches, you know? And that, that's sad, or it's even in our in individual lives. But maybe it's because we haven't truly seen the Lord for who He is. Where in this scene, there's no doubt who He is. There's a clear picture of Jesus in this picture, in this scene in heaven. So whatever the case, here's what's going to happen when we leave this world and we're standing in the presence of that one who sits on the throne in the Lamb of God. We're going to be participating in some honest-to-goodness worship. That's what for the rest of eternity. So it might not hurt to start getting a little practice in while we're here, right? Because that's a great day that's coming. Because if you know God, to know God is to worship Him. To know God is to have eternal life. So if we equate those two, if we want to embrace the eternal life that's given to us by the blood of Jesus, then that almost makes it necessary that we engage in true worship of Jesus and see Him for who He really is. He is the worthy Lamb of God slain for the sin of the world.
and, and there, there is no one like him. Let me pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for giving us such a beautiful uh, testimony by John as he's um, seen this heavenly vision and, and you have seen fit to have him record it for us so we can read and study and, and visualize these things and uh, inspire us to seek your face even more and, and, and understand that you truly are worthy. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. We can't repeat that often enough. And so, Father, I pray we wouldn't just repeat it, but we would know it and believe it because it's the truth. Help us to worship you uh, through eyes and, and through a, a lens that takes into account who you truly are. Help us to see you more clearly, worship you more fully. And, Lord, help us to praise you because you have ransomed people by your blood from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And we are so thankful. Thank you for the blood of Christ, which cleanses us from sin. And we pray in his holy name. Amen.